Well, welcome everybody. We're happy to be doing this call today. I had to laugh earlier because I was thinking this would be the quintessential captive audience. Nobody can go anywhere, and what we're going to talk about is why we can't go anywhere, and more importantly, how our gelsolin therapy can get us back to our normal lives. So I call this the new old way to fight infection because we're actually capitalizing on evolutionary wisdom. Please take a moment and read our disclaimer slide. When we're talking about evolution, I guess you could say evolution couldn't predict the emergence of lawyers. But this is something that's standard today. We're dedicating our entire corporate effort to commercialize the work of our founding scientist, the late Tom Stossel, who discovered gel solin and its role in cell motility. Tom was an incredible person with a great sense of humor. He was professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, elected to the National Academy of Sciences, and the past president of the American Society of Hematology, just to name a few accolades. If you sat down and read through his 40-page curriculum vita, you'd certainly wonder what you've done with your life. As I said, Tom's initial discovery was finding out how cells could move. He discovered a protein inside the cell that interacted with yet another protein in the wall of the cell called actin. This mystery protein changed the actin from a gel state to a soluble state, so he named it gel solin. This was the start of a series of remarkable findings. Like many other great drug discoveries, it took some time to unravel the mechanism and identify disease targets. The first thing that surprised them that it was observed that there was another version of gel solin in the plasma, and later they realized that it came out of the blood after an injury to clear away the cell debris. Later on, additional research showed the molecule had specific binding sites on it that allowed it to clear the debris, but also it had other sites where it bound to inflammatory mediators, which are the components of inflammation. The cartoon shows those binding sites. Very recently, through a collaboration with the Harvard School of Public Health, and funded by the NIH, Dr. Lester Kobzik made yet another remarkable discovery, which was that Joe Solon improves the ability of the macrophage not only to have greater uptake of pathogens, but also much better killing of them after they're ingested. The last picture shows a macrophage doing its work. Charles Dickens wrote about a tale of two cities, and what we're talking about here is a tale of two immune systems. Our original immune system, referred to as the innate immune system, is where gel solin plays, because it's like a master regulator of the inflammatory response, which is part of this system. Your inflammatory response is what heals you, but it can also hurt you. It's been highly conserved by evolution, back to the fruit fly. Millions of years later, the adaptive immune system evolved. These are your T cells, B cells, and antibodies, etc. It's, it's precisely targeted, but it's slow to respond, and it takes a lot of time for it to adapt to a particular threat. Think about how long it takes you to benefit from a flu shot. The key takeaway is that you have to survive the initial innate response, or you won't live long enough to recover after the adaptive immune system has eliminated the pathogen attack. Our innate immune system is really an ancient defense system, and gel solin's role is to protect you from the ravages of that system. It's a naturally occurring human protein. It's highly abundant, about 200 micrograms per milliliter, and one of the most abundant proteins in blood that nobody knew anything about until Tom discovered the intracellular version. The amazing thing about how gel solin functions is that it's pathogen agnostic. It works in both viral and bacterial infections. In the viral setting, what we're predominantly going to talk about is it, how it has the effect of keeping inflammation local and not allowing it to go systemic where it can hurt you. It does the same thing in the bacterial infection, but our research has shown definitively that it empowers white blood cells to have greater uptake and killing of the pathogen that might be attacking you. Let's jump right to uh, viruses here because this is what's on everybody's mind today. And a good example of a virus is our friend COVID-19. A virus, for those of you who may not know, is just kind of like a copy machine. It enters a cell and sets up shop. 
pumping more and more copies of itself back into circulation. Other cells get hijacked and the same process goes on and on. Eventually, the hijacked cells die and create excess inflammation. In COVID-19 cases, what we have seen is that the inflammation typically attacks the lungs and sometimes other organs if they're previously compromised. The important takeaway here is that death can occur even after the immune system has eliminated the virus. A person dies, but what do they die from? They die from the inflammatory attack. To summarize gel solid therapy as it applies to viruses, it protects you from the inflammation even after the virus is gone, and it's going to work regardless of future mutations. That's a really important point because all the things they're developing today, like vaccines and antibodies, might work today, but they may not work next year or six months from now. So the key takeaway from my standpoint is to stay alive and let your immune system do the work. What we have actually demonstrated in animals is that even delaying treatment of gelsalin can improve outcomes in severe influenza. This particular model uses a very lethal type, and what we show is that we can improve survival by greater than 50% over placebo, and importantly, treatment, I believe, started after day 7, and what is shown here, we believe, will translate into humans. Both gelsalin and inflammation exist in mice, too. Another consideration for COVID-19 patients is that when their lungs get attacked, they get very leaky. And this model demonstrates the protection gel solin can provide to the lungs. In this study, rats were burned on 40% of their body. And they did not die from the burn. They died from the hit to the lungs. As you can see here, there was a normal group, and the burn group, and a treatment group. As you go up the scale, it increases the leakiness of the lungs. So you can see the burn group had extreme microvascular permeability, as a scientist would say. But when the burn group was given gel solin, the permeability numbers were almost normal, almost no leakiness. And the interesting observation is that gel solin levels dropped immediately after the burn and were only about 10% of normal at 12 hours, showing the correlation of the severity of the injury to gel solin levels. So that covers the general theory on viruses. And when we go to bacteria, it's a similar system. When bacteria directly attack a cell, the same, same story plays out. Gel solin promotes the good aspects of inflammation by clearing the cell debris, which in turn starts systemic levels to fall. They fall in proportion to the amount of cell damage. And this further reduces the ability of the macrophages to take up and kill the bacteria. As gel solin levels decline, the overabundance of inflammation can get released into the circulation and attack otherwise healthy organs. Losing the battle on both fronts causes what we refer to as circling the drain because it can happen very, very quickly. So let's drill down and see exactly what's going on with the macrophage as it responds to bacteria. Researchers in Dr. Kopsik's lab at the Harvard School of Public Health showed that actin, which is what we told you was inside the cell and plays a part in cell motility, it actually binds to scavenger receptors on the macrophage. Now when that happens, these receptors basically get clogged up and it lessens the ability of the macrophage to take up the bacteria. Here we can see as gel solin comes out of the blood, it cleans off the receptors and the macrophages can act like the vacuum cleaner to ingest pathogens. But another discovery was that gel solid actually activates a particular pathway inside that cell, which causes them to have greater killing. So you not only get greater uptake, you get better killing due to the activation of that NOS3 pathway. The result is you get better faster. And we have plenty of anecdotal evidence to show that as people recover, their gel solid level 
actually precedes the recovery. Here's what we saw in an animal model of bacterial pneumonia. This type of pneumonia is virtually 100% resistant to penicillin. It's no wonder that the penicillin group died at the same rate as the placebo group. Th those are the black and orange lines. Gilsolin reduced mortality in antibiotic-resistant pneumonia by an enormous amount. Combining gelsolin with a previously ineffective penicillin had an even larger effect than gelsolin alone. You might say we're making antibiotics great again. This was supported by two National Institute of Health grants. In summary, we've demonstrated evidence that gelsolin therapy actually boosts macrophage function to have greater uptake and killing of the bacteria. It also works regardless of antibiotic resistance. As we saw in the previous slide, it creates a powerful synergy that reactivates ineffective antibiotics. The key takeaway here is wow. So you might be thinking, well, if this is so good, why doesn't the body just make more when it needs it and then nobody gets sick? It's because gelsolin is secreted from every cell, but it's only produced at a steady state. And you can see in the picture on the left, these Two people are not practicing social distancing, so the person on the right became ill, and you can see that the gelsolin level fell to critical levels. At this point, the body loses its ability to defend from a pathogen and the resulting inflammatory attack. Obviously, evolution had its reasons for designing the system this way, because it had to work locally, but it also had to be available systemically. The opportunity for gel solid therapy is enormous because it's a pathogen-independent approach that protects regardless of mutations or antibiotic resistance. It has mechanisms that work in both viral and bacterial attacks. In both cases, it prevents the spread of inflammation. We also talked about empowering white blood cells to have greater uptake and killing of bacteria. Repletion, using modern genetic engineering methods, corrects for evolution's shortcomings, and this is what we intend to do. We've already developed a highly productive manufacturing process, which will also be highly profitable as we scale up to commercial production levels. The other thing that's worth showing you here is that gelsolin actually becomes depleted in a lot of different situations. It's not only about viruses or bacteria. It also affects other types of conditions like trauma, burns, surgery, diabetes. There have been many studies done because at the end of the day, it's inflammation that's behind most things that can hurt you. We have analyzed this and believe that in total, this could equate to about a $50 billion portfolio of opportunities. The other amazing thing about BioAegis is that we've demonstrated this effect in over 20 animal models, and it's important to understand that these were done by independent laboratories. As a biotech investor, you should always be suspicious when all of a company's data comes out of one lab. Oftentimes, it's their own. But in our particular case, these studies were done by independent laboratories and research institutions, and they've demonstrated, demonstrated substantial efficacy in broad areas like infection, inflammation, neurological diseases, injury, and trauma. I won't go through all of them, but the consistency here is absolutely amazing. We have numerous ongoing collaborations with very prestigious institutions, as you can see here. I think we have over 20 different collaborations, and we regularly receive requests for additional ones. Obviously, we're not large enough to do all the work ourselves. Now I'd like to talk briefly about our operations. The management team and scientific staff have made tremendous progress. We actually have a research laboratory located in New Jersey. BioAegis has completed our Phase 1b2a safety study in pneumonia patients. It was a randomized placebo control study, and it was actually a dose escalation study. I'm not going to read you all the different components here, but the important takeaway from this is that it was once again proven that gelsolin is safe. While you can never say never, the likelihood of a natural occurring protein hurting you, I believe, would be slim to none. 
The other amazing thing we saw in this study was that some of the patients received massive doses of gelsolin. And in one of the cohorts, the patients wound up getting what we call a supraphysiologic dose or higher than normal. And even in those patients, we didn't see any adverse events. As you may understand, most clinical trials fail because of safety. And we don't believe that this is a significant risk for us, which really increases our odds of success. Here are the next steps. We're currently planning both a European and U.S. regulatory filing to get ready for our next clinical study. We're gearing up to produce clinical supplies in anticipation of these next trials. Importantly, we're pursuing fast track in multiple territories for COVID-19. And believe me, the phone is beginning to ring now. We've spent the last couple of years sort of under the radar through no fault of our own because people weren't really that interested in investing in infectious disease. All it takes is a pandemic to get everybody's attention. We're working diligently and methodically with our heads down to prepare for the next stage of growth for this company. As you can see there, we're looking at other indications like bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis, inflammatory arthritis, and some other ones that we're not at liberty to talk about at this time. Turning to our capital plan, what's amazing is that we've achieved significant success with very little funding. Progress to date has been accomplished with approximately $50 million in funding prior to BioAegis and with $19 million in funding that we've raised mainly from family offices and wealthy individuals. We've also received approximately $4.3 million in NIH grants. Our last round was completed in Q3 of 2018 where we raised $4.1 million and that funded the safety study that I showed you. And we also began to advance secondary indications while also preparing for a larger efficacy study. We're currently raising a bridge finance of up to $5 million, which is in process. If people want to learn about that, you can email me, and I can uh, inform you how that works. But ultimately, we're targeting, targeting to raise up to $30 million, including an institutional round. All of this is underway. The, the trial designs are complete, and we are ready to go to FDA and the Asian authorities, authorities and also back to the EU. The bridge funding will allow us to keep operations going and to accelerate our manufacturing efforts. We have multiple discussions in process right now for partnering in both the U.S. and internationally, as I hinted at before. All of the activities I previously described are going to require funding. And this pie chart shows you just what we're going to do with the $30 million that we're looking to raise. The amazing thing is that in the world of biotech, this isn't a lot of money. I've read something somewhere recently that said that the average amount of money required to get a drug through to approval is $2 billion. Well, we've progressed this far with $20 million, and we're estimating that all we'll need is the $30 million to get all the way to proof of concept. We're not looking for billions of dollars here. And for investors... That means we're not talking about massive dilution going forward. BioEgis has strong proprietary protection at least till 2028. And we need funding to feed our patent attorneys because we have a massive patent portfolio that spans the globe and we intend to pursue other patents as well. Speaking of this, we have over 40 issued patents. And these are in extremely broad areas like infection, inflammatory disease, renal failure, multiple sclerosis, and neurologic disease. We filed IP on our own in 2019, and that application is in process now. Our patents also cover diagnostic uses, because the lower your gel solid levels, the more likely you are to become sick. They also cover animal indications because gelsolin exists across species. And we're actually beginning discussions with an animal health company. We've also protected our manufacturing process. We have a proprietary cell system that we use, and we're getting massive yields of protein. 
We think that the margins on this business are going to be enormous. And having the most productive manufacturing process is also a form of protection. But even more importantly, we have biologic exclusivity, which is 12 years post-approval in the U.S., and in Europe, it's 11 years. In some cases, this is better than our patents. I'd also like to highlight our management team, which is an experienced group of professionals. Susan Levinson, our CEO, and Valerie Siva, our COO, both have years of experience at Siva Geigy and Novartis. Their skill sets span the entire value chain of the industry. Mark Denubli, our chief medical officer, spent 17 years at Merck as an, ex as an infectious disease expert and did some of the early gelsolin research. Lester Kopsik, who has now taken over Tom's role as on the Scientific Advisory Board, came out of the Harvard School of Public Health, where he discovered Gelsolin's ability to boost macrophage function. It's important for investors to understand that BioAegis has an outstanding management team with the necessary skills to move the company forward. One of the things we did immediately upon forming BioAegis was, well, we realized that we had to get the advice of top experts in the field of critical care. So we put together what we refer to as the dream team of critical care doctors. And these gentlemen are more than just faces on a page. They actually participate and they're all committed to getting this technology over the goal line. Including, in Europe, Jean-Louis Vincent, who is a professor and a key opinion leader in the field of intensive care out of Brussels. So what I think you can see is that we have a solid clinical advisory board to rely on for advice and guidance to move the company forward. BioAegis is commercializing what we believe is a game-changing platform. We have strong evidence, as I showed you in over 20 animal models, there's obviously an enormous market need, especially with what's been going on today with COVID-19. There's also a minimal safety risk because it's a normal blood protein that's already demonstrated a benign safety pro profile in clinical studies, actually more than one. We have a high yield manufacturing process. It's already been biophilized, which means freeze dried. You can think of instant coffee. You just have to add water and you've got gel solid. We have an extensive intellectual property portfolio. It's worldwide, out of Harvard and other prestigious institutions. And importantly, we also are a biologic, so we have biologic exclusivity. All of this combined with a highly seasoned management team is a recipe for success. What I hope you take home from this presentation today is that BioAegis is disrupting the course of infectious and inflammatory diseases. It is, as I said before, the new old way to fight infection, or should I say the new improved way to fight infection. It could positively impact the world in a big way and get us out of the house again. Thank you very much for participating.